Hey Rob, let's talk about uh, let's talk about your background. I mean, we know your YouTube channel, Rob Skiba, and uh, we'll talk about your books as well. But how did you get involved in this world, uh, ministry through ministry? But well, let, let's start at the very beginning. Okay, the very beginning, June 26, 1969. <laughs> That's when I was born. And less than a month later, and nobody believes me when I say this, but I've been able to describe the room accurately uh, in, in quite a bit of detail. I remember um, less than a month later after I was born, I remember sitting in my mom's lap watching the television of man allegedly walking on the moon. And, and dad was taking pictures of it. I have the photo album of my dad's photos that he took of the television set, <laughs> uh, you know, of Neil Armstrong and whatnot, supposedly walking on the moon and stuff like that. So from a very, very young age, I was sort of marked uh, in, in that regard. I mean, I, I always had an obsession with space and wanting to be an astronaut. It was my life ambition. Uh, and it only intensified in 1977 when I saw Star Wars. I mean, my, my seven-year-old mind was blown <laughs> when I saw that movie 13 times in the theater the first year it came out. And God knows how many times after that. Um, loved the movie. And I, and I made a declaration by the time when I was eight years old, I said, I will either be a, an astronaut, a filmmaker, a movie star, or dead by the time I'm 30. And I didn't have a death wish or anything like that. It's just as an eight-year-old, 30s like this, you know, <laughs> ancient, you know, <laughs> you're, you're real old. So my, my thinking was if I hadn't achieved one of those things by the time I was 30, it would have had to, it would have, had to have been because I was dead. Um, so I got busy right away. I mean, I did well in school. I got a telescope and, at a young age and was always out in my front yard. And in the evening, my parents, you know, at my parents' house, if it was a nice clear night, I was outside. I had one of those star chart wheels where you can, you know, see, see wherever, you know, point it north or whatever direction you're looking and wheel it into the date and see what you're supposed to see. And I, at that time, I can't do it really anymore, but I could point to almost anything in the sky and tell you what it was, you know, what the constellation was, what the star was, if it was a planet. Um, looking at the moon. I mean, I love that stuff. But I remember going to the Springfield Planetarium. I, I lived in Massachusetts, and I would uh, they had a big telescope there. And I would ask them, I said, you know, put, sh put it on the Sea of Tranquility. I want to I see the, the lunar lander, you know, and, uh, you know, the dune buggies and all that stuff, you know, and, and uh, at the other sites and whatnot. And they would never do it. They would always tell me, well, you know, it's not powerful enough. We can't see it and blah, blah, blah. And then later on, as Hubble came out and all these other things, you know, they could see a read a dime from outer space, supposedly. I'm like, okay, somebody point the thing at the moon. I want to see this, you know. And it, it seemed like nobody would ever do it. So I became very suspicious of the space program um, early on uh, in my mm, early 30s, I should say, after I didn't become an astronaut. <laughs> and, and didn't die. <laughs> Didn't die. I, I did uh, become a filmmaker. I was uh, at that time doing a lot of corporate video, uh, and uh, then later ended up becoming a missionary and traveled to over a dozen countries uh, doing uh, videos that help them to create awareness for what they do and help them raise support. So, on the filmmaking side, I haven't made it a motion picture or a television series yet, but I've done a, a ton of documentary uh, videos and stuff like that. Um, but as I was doing a lot of these documentaries, becoming more and more of a researcher to do these documentaries, um, I started questioning things. And in 2006, while I was actually on a plane ride to, well, as a missionary to uh, Kazakhstan, uh, the people behind me were talking about 9-11 being an inside job. Now, at that time, I had was very much still in the camp that I believe that, you know, box cutter toting terrorists, uh, you know, the, the official story. I very much believe the official story. And for the whole flight, and it was like 14 hours, I'm listening to these guys behind me, and I'm, I'm furious. I am like just so mad because I was in the Army for eight years, and one of the reasons I joined the Army because I wanted to fly helicopters and became a helicopter pilot because I had heard that the astronauts had to learn helicopters to fly the lunar landers. So I figured I'd fly helicopters and then transition into the Air Force once I got that down, fly jets, then put my application in for, for NASA. So very patriotic, third-generation Army guy, listening to these guys, you know, trash my country, you know, basically. And, and it made me so mad. I did my job there in Kazakhstan. And when I came back home, I'm like, I'm going to prove those guys wrong. You know, I'd never see them again, but I figured I'm going to prove them wrong, at least for my, myself. And as soon as I took the time to actually do the research, I very quickly realized that a lot of what they were saying was true. And that's a paradigm shift type of moment right there where you're just like, oh my God, what do I do with this information, you know? Uh, and the more I looked into 9-11, the more sickening and disgusting it became. 
And um, that led to me eventually in 2012 publishing my first book, Babylon Rising and the First Shall Be Last, which dealt with a lot of government conspiracy type things. And, and the fact that our government officials, at least the higher levels, presidential levels, are, in my mind, Luciferians to the core, worshipers of Osiris with all of their Freemason and skull and bones rituals and things of that nature, uh, Illuminati and you know all that kind of stuff. And then finding out that our founding fathers weren't really Christians, like we were all taught that they were, that these guys were actually deists, and looking into the, the format and layout of Washington, D.C., and how it's all very occultic. Um, you know, That's what that whole book was, basically my journey in, into researching uh, all of that, and what, what are the implications of that? What does it mean? And I called it Babylon Rising uh, because I believe that Babylon is rising, but has been here for a long time, um, ever since the original Babylon. It, it's taken off into a s slightly different format and becoming what we might call mystery Babylon or spiritual Babylon, but physical Babylon is also rising, and that's sort of what I was dealing with in that book was the United States' involvement in the Middle East. I believe physical Babylon will be in the original place of the first Babylon. But if if and when that Babylon does rise, and I would contend that it already has risen, it is only because of us. So we are certainly, you know, some people out there are saying that we are Babylon and I understand the arguments. Uh, they're very good and compelling arguments, but I believe that we are Babylon in the sense that we are the system that has carried that philosophy and, and, and all the mystery religions and all that forward in what uh, Francis Bacon would have termed the uh, New Atlantis. Um, we are the agents through which Babylon will rise and has risen, in my mind, already. Um, but as part of that, it was December 21st, 2010. I'm a late-nighter, so, and my wife and I both are. So we were out walking at 2, 2, 2 in the morning, Central Standard Time, which was 3, 2, 2 Eastern Standard Time. And I'd already done a lot of research on Skull and Bones and their logo with the 3, 2, 2 underneath it and all kinds of stuff on the numbers 3, 2, 2. And so here it is. 322 Eastern Standard Time, 222 Central, and I'm looking up and the moon's turning blood red. Everybody's talking about the blood moons today, right? Well, December 21st on the winter solstice of 2010, the moon turned blood red at 322 Eastern and was blood red for 72 minutes floating over the shoulders of Orion, which is the stellar constellation that Osiris became known by, and Osiris is Nimrod. So Nimrod's the mighty hunter of scripture, and this is the mighty hunter constellation in the sky. And he was decapitated. Uh, the Franken the story, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is a stylized version of Osiris, basically. It's the Osiris slash Nimrod story. So here I'm seeing the mighty hunter with his head looking like it's floating back over his shoulder, like a decapitated head. Um, and I, I told my wife, I said, I don't know exactly what's going on right now, but I know this is very significant. We've got to get home right now. So I got home and I started researching like crazy. I had like 50 browser windows open. And there's another YouTube guy out there, uh, Dutch Synths. And uh, he, Dutch is always looking at like um, harp and weather anomalies and things of that nature. Well, he was online live at that moment tracking on the internet seismic server website that tracks um, earthquake activity around the world. And he's got it live on the screen and everything's going in the black. Like literally the graph is showing that the whole world was shaking at that moment while this decapitated head's going over Nimrod's shoulders. And uh, the next morning I found out that while that was happening here at nighttime in, in the United States, it's daytime in the Middle East, Iraq was announcing its fully formed government saying, hey, we're back in business again as Nimrod, the founder of Babylon, his head is kind of going back to attach to his body again. So I'm going, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And it was within weeks of that event that we all of a sudden had uh, hundreds of thousands of birds falling from the sky, breed specific. It wasn't like random birds. It was like, you know, one breed of bird was falling and, and millions of fish beaching themselves. Uh, same thing, breed specific. And, and then they added the 13th sign to the Zodiac, Ophiuchus. And Ophiuchus in the mythology was uh, Asclepius, and he was known for his healing abilities. And specifically, uh, his, uh, he, he raised Orion from the dead. And he got so good at his healing abilities and resurrection powers that he actually began to empty Hades such that the entity Hades got mad that the domain Hades was being emptied. So he complained to his brother Zeus, and Zeus said, okay, I'll take care of the problem. And he throws Asclepius up into the sky, and he becomes the constellation we now call Ophiuchus, the serpent handler.
Your zodiac sign was determined by Babylonians based on what constellation the sun was in on the day you were born. But astronomers at the Minnesota Planetarium Society point out things have changed over thousands of years. The Earth has shifted on its axis and shifted us up one sign on the zodiac wheel. Right between November 29th and December 17th, there is a new sign. It is Ophiuchus. The constellation is a dude wrestling a snake. Birds, fish, and all kinds of creatures just dropping dead. 8,000 dead turtle doves in Italy. Hundreds of birds dead in Rockwell, Texas. 500 red-winged blackbirds in Louisiana. 3,000 dead red-winged blackbirds in Arkansas. Several hundred dead in Kentucky. On the fish, several hundred snapper fish in New Zealand. Thousands of dead fish in Florida. 40,000 devil crabs in the UK. 80,000 drum fish in Arkansas. Two million spot croakers in Maryland. In the last two weeks, this is all a sign of the apocalypse. So, like, all of that happened in very short order after the the eclipse that I saw, the blood moon of December 21st, 2010. Of course, at that time, we were all speculating about what's going to happen on to December 21st, 2012, because the Aztec calendar stone, the Mayans, and all that. And um, I was speculating, like a lot of people, about what could be happening uh, on that day, because there were a lot of things pointing to it. Just like, you know, to be fair, a lot of things pointing to December 20, or today, uh, September 23rd. But this was like ancient stuff. I mean, right now, people are pointing to movies and television shows. You know, hey, look at all these memes. With December 21st, 2012, I mean, you had the Aztec calendar stone goes back to 3114 BC. And I mean, you had lots of cultures from antiquity pointing forward in time to this date. So it was very intriguing. Um, but that date came and went with with nothing, as far as I know, uh, that, that happened. But when I went back and reanalyzed on the backside of it, I'm like, okay, why why was everybody wrong? <laughs> you know, on this. Now, I never came out and said, this is this is what's going to happen on December 21st. I'm just, I was saying, hey, a lot of people are saying something's going to happen. And then nothing apparently did happen. But when I went back to look into it, I had realized I already found the clue and I wrote about it in the last chapter of my book, Truth or Tradition. And in that chapter, I pointed out that Jesus was not born on December 25th. He, that's that's the, that's the Antichrist birthday, basically. It's all the dying and resurrecting soul, sun gods of antiquity. He was born during the fall feast season, which we are in right now. Day of Atonement uh, begins today at sunset. Um, I believe he was born on Feast of Trumpets, and I give all my reasons for it. But the biggest reason for it was the scripture in Revelation chapter 12 gives a stellar alignment for his birth. A woman clothed with the sun, 12 stars at her head, and the moon at her feet. That exact alignment, Virgo with the, with the sun in her belly, and the crescent new moon at her feet, and the nine stars of Leo plus the... the planets of, uh, I think it was Jupiter, Venus, and Mercury were all right at our head for 80 minutes in, in human history, 80 minutes. And those 80 minutes took place on September 11th, 3 BC, which on the Gregorian calendar is reckoned as negative two because of no z year zero deal. So I, I thought, whoa, maybe that's it. Maybe our calendar is off by two years because uh, the events that took place on December 21st, 2010 were so significant that if they would have happened on, in 2012, everybody in their talking parrot would have been, you know, out there uh, going off on this deal. But it, nobody caught it because nobody was, you know, I happened to be walking around at 2, 2, 2 in the morning and saw this stuff and was putting the pieces together, uh, you know, afterwards. But if all the events that happened on December 21st, 2010 happened on, on December 21st, 2012, I think everybody would have probably agreed, oh, okay, this is it. And I think the reason like I said, is because our calendar is off by two years based on the birth of Christ being in negative two on the Gregorian calendar. So um, that was what really sent me on the journey that led me to where I am right now. Uh, that was my first book um, was a result of blogging for 2011, the whole year. After that event in 2010, I just started writing. I woke up in the morning, whatever I thought about, I wrote. And I ended up at the end of 2011 taking a step back and saying, I wonder how much I wrote. And I pulled it off a of blog format, put it into print format software, and saw that I had over a thousand pages of content. I thought, wow, I need to turn these into books. So Babylon Rising was the first book that I pulled out of those thousand pages. And in the chapter one of that book, 
uh, it was called the Genesis 6 experiment, talking about the angels of Genesis 6 that came down and made it with women and produced the angel-human hybrids called the Nephilim, which are the titans of Greek mythology, uh, the Anunnaki of the Sumerian mythology. All, every, every ancient culture basically has the same story. They just use different names and to, to describe it. Um, that was probably the shortest chapter of the book, the Genesis 6 experiment. After I wrote that book, I realized that I got to really unpack that chapter. So the second book, Archon Invasion, was a 366-page elaboration <laughs> on chapter one of my first book. And I had intentions of continuing my saga that I had started with these books when all of a sudden I find myself on this topic of flat freaking earth of all things. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, I mean, I had a lot of other little side projects going on between the publishing of Archon and recently getting involved with this. But in April of this year, I happened to listen to Mark Sargent's interview with, um, he was on Canary Cry with uh, Basil and Gons uh, on, on Canary Cry Radio. And um, I thought it was a joke. It, I, I was, it was April 13th. I was heading down to uh, do my taxes and it was my accountant's an hour and a half away. So I was looking for something that I could, a podcast to listen to on my drive. And I saw that and I thought, you know, cause this was like April 13th and it was, had already been recorded. So I thought, you know, maybe this is an April fool's joke, you know, <laughs> flat earth, whatever. <laughs> so I listened to this thing for an hour and a half driving down uh, to do my taxes. And at first, you know, I'm rolling my eyes and, like everybody else. Uh, but then by the end of it, I'm going, well, shoot, that guy kind of made a little bit of sense. You know? So I did my taxes and I got back in the car. So I got to listen to that again. So I listened to it again on my drive home and I thought, man, I'm going to look this guy up. So I watched all of his, uh, I think he had 11 parts of the um, Flat Earth Clues videos at that time. Watched them all and reached out because he put his phone number at the end of every <laughs> video. I said, boy, this guy's, you know, he's kind of gutsy. So I, you know, I called him up and uh, asked him if he'd be on my radio show. So he came on my show um, that week. It was, it was all very quick. So I was like, I listened to it. I think it was on Monday and had him on my show on Wednesday. And I, you know, I listened at that time when I was talking to him, if you, if you heard the show I did with him, I was saying, Hey, you know, I still very much believe in the spinning heliocentric globe. Um, I believe in the expanding earth model that uh, Neil Adams talks about the, and, and had just did a teaching on it back in December. As a matter of fact, uh, that was something I was, I kept saying throughout the episode, you know, I still very much believe this, but what you're saying is really interesting. You know, tell me more. Um, and when I got off that interview, I thought, man, I, I can't let this go. I've got to look into this. And the first thing I did was looking to the pictures because he challenged me. He said, hey, you know, go ahead and see if you can prove the globe, but do so without using the word NASA or the military or the government because <laughs> that's where most of our sources for the globe come from. Well, at first I, I had the, the thought that everybody else has. We've all seen the pictures, but those pictures come from NASA, the military, and the government. But, I, you know, I'm going to look into it anyway. So as I started looking into those pictures and realizing they are either – questionable at best um, when you see the Apollo 11 footage of the astronauts faking the, the globular shape of the Earth through an, a, a round window in their spacecraft. Um, that gives you a real big red flag going, what, what, what's up with that? You know, um, And then you don't really get a picture of the Earth until the, the Apollo 17 uh, famous one that we've all seen. And then Matt Boylan comes out and he's like, you know, that's a painting. And so and I'm looking at, I'm an artist, I'm a painter, um, not quite as good as, as some of these guys like Matt Boylan is. I mean, he's very photorealistic with his artwork, um, but I'm questioning it now, you know, and then you look at all the other blue marbles that they put out and they are, I mean, if you read the fine print, they're telling you these are composite images. This is artwork. This is, and when you look into, look into the composite images, they're not even good composite images. They're very bad composite images. I'm a Photoshop guy. I live in Photoshop. Almost every day I'm doing something in Photoshop. I can show you and have shown people the, the clone where they're using the clone tool to replicate clouds. This cloud is exactly the same as this cloud. These five clouds are exactly the same as this one, you know, and showing you they're using the Photoshop clone tool. And you're like, well, wait a minute. You're telling us we're taking pictures of Pluto. We've taken pictures of Jupiter and Saturn, you know, mass, supposedly massively, massively huge planets, way bigger than ours. And yet we have to have cartoon artwork uh, and bad composite Photoshop images of, of our world? Really? Then you start seeing videos, allegedly shot time-lapse videos from satellites showing the Earth in rotation. Uh, in one case, 25 hours of time-lapse rotation, and the clouds aren't changing. You're, you're like, 
and some people say, well, they really are. You just got to get a higher resolution. And I've looked at the higher resolution one, which I questioned because I don't even think they had that ability in 1990. To, so it looks like somebody just redid it. Um, but even still, th the amount of movement that you are seeing is negligible for 25 hours. I mean, set a camera up outside for an hour and then speed it up on your computer and see how much cloud movement you get. You know, so I, I, I began to question all of it. And uh, that was the first thing I did. The second thing I did, I'm a, I'm a Bible believing Christian. So I, the first thing I should have done, it would have been to consult the scriptures. It was actually the second thing I did. When I did that though, uh, I was done because at this point <laughs> you cannot get, and I tried, you cannot get a spinning heliocentric globe out of the scriptures. You get the exact opposite. You get a, a circular fixed stationary world set on pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars are placed on day four. And and I've taught creation science type stuff for years. I used to teach. It was sort of a my own spin-off version of uh, Kent Hovind's material combined with a little bit from uh, you know Henry Morris and Carl Baugh and some of these other big guys in, in the creation world. Um, and we always had this model, you know, Carl Baugh, I think, was the originator of it, and Kent Hovind certainly talked about it a lot, of the canopy theory, that the globe was was covered with a, basically an ice canopy, and that was the firmament. I taught that as recently as December of last year. Mm -hmm. And But when you go back and look at it, because all of us approach the text with preconceived biases from things that we've been told. And when I decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to look into the scriptures, um, but do so with the mentality that I have never heard about a globe. I've never heard anything about the earth as a ball. So I'm going to come to the text as freshly as I, as I can come to it as freshly as possible without preconceived notions and biases and just let the text say what it says. What would I get out of it? And I didn't get very far. Genesis chapter 1 and it tells you that on day four, he put the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament, not outside and around it. And I'm going, how did I miss that? I have, I have read that. I can't tell you how many times I've read that. I can't tell you how many times I've taught that. I can't tell you how many times I've depicted it in PowerPoint presentations and stuff. <laughs> and yet there it is. Sun, moon, and stars in the firmament. And then, you, and then when you realize Job predates Genesis. Job was written before Genesis. Job goes into even more detail. And then you read what Solomon had to say about it. And you read what all these guys had to say. And you finally get to Isaiah. And he's the one everybody wants to quote, Isaiah 40, 22, the circle of the earth. Well, he, but, and especially if you're a King James only type and, and, and you know, God bless the guys that are out there. I, I've, I've been around you my whole life. I understand your arguments. I don't happen to agree with you, but I understand their arguments. But if you're a King James only guy, welcome to the Flat Earth Society. Because, <laughs> man, you can't get around it. And Isaiah is the only guy that used the word ball. The problem is he didn't use it in chapter 40, verse 22. He used it in chapter 22, verse 18. He says, I'll throw you like a ball. And if you look up the Hebrew word for that, it's dur. The Hebrew word ball, dur. The Hebrew word that he used for circle is chug. So he knew the difference in Hebrew, and we should know the difference in English. And apparently the King James translators did because they translated Dor as ball in 22, 18, and Chug as circle in 40, 22. So yeah, at, at this point, I, I'm kind of like, I, I, what am I going to do? Because I've spent my entire ministry, you know, you, you, a little bit about my background. I accepted Christ as my Savior as age seven. Has been in, I've been in some form of ministry my entire life, since vacation Bible school in my parents' front yard to uh, teaching Sunday school to starting the drama ministry in my church, writing, directing, and playing Jesus and Passion Plays on Ishtar Day, <laughs> uh, Christmas Plays on you know, Nimrod Boner Day, and uh, <laughs> uh, and then you know become a missionary for six and a half years. So I've, I've been in the scriptures my entire life. I've been in ministry my entire life. And I've built my ministry on saying that the Bible is my source for truth, that it is the absolute truth, and that we can take it literally. Well, but when you do that with regard to this particular subject, you're stuck in a snow globe. And so here we are. <laughs> I, the, the, you know, this has been my journey since April 15th, really, of, uh, of this year. And, you know, I haven't been, with, with, the, with the exception of a few um, health issues and family, fam, family drama and things like that, this has been all I've been able to do. 
I'm obsessed with it. I wake up in the morning and that's all I think about. And then I'm doing something related to it till I go to sleep. Um, that's why I created the website testingtheglobe.com. And people ask me, well, are you flat earther? And I keep saying, well, no, right now I'm still a questioning globalist, but I don't even think I can say that anymore. I don't think I can even say I'm a questioning globalist anymore because I, I had somebody said, well, why do you still believe in the globe? I said, well, um, because I haven't seen that that one foolproof, indisputable piece of evidence for the flat earth. Textually, yes, it's there, no unquestionably. But the physical, tangible evidence. I mean, I've seen the tests. I've seen the horizon footage of the weather balloons. I've seen, I've done tests myself, and they indicate flat. But there's always the yabbit yeah, guy that shows up and, well, that's a mirage, or that's a light bending, this is that, whatever. You know, there's always some kind of marginally plausible counter argument. And so I had made the statement, I haven't seen that one indisputable evidence for the flat earth. And somebody said, well, what indisputable evidence do you have for the globe? I said, huh, got me. So I can't, I, I'm, I don't know where I am right now. I, frankly, I think I'm a, I'll say I'm a zetetic agnostic when it comes to this. Um, maybe that's the, the best title I could go with right now. Um, uh, textually speaking, no question. The ancient record, not just the Hebrew biblical uh, or even extra biblical, no question. The Hebrew text was very flat earth, snow globe. But the Egyptians thought the same way. The Hindus thought the same way. The Sumerians thought the same way. The Babylonians, even the early Greeks did. You know, the, the Greeks, by the time you get to about three to 200 BC, started to change their views on some things. But early, you go further back, everybody's a snow globe. So then you got to ask yourself the question, well, wait a minute. We have all this technology, right? We're so smart. Yeah, you know, we've got all this stuff, but we, yet we're so smart we think we came from monkeys. So, how, I mean, how smart are we? The ancients are building megalithic structures that with all our modern technology and all of our equipment, everything that we have, we can't figure out how they did it. And they had a keen understanding of the cosmos, so much so that the Aztec calendar stone shows up in 3114 BC and is very, very, very accurate. So we've got to throw out the evolutionary mindset of the further back we go, the you know dumber cave dwellers they you know they were. No, it's the exact opposite. The further back you go, the more impressive it gets. We're looking back on uh, here we are in the 21st century. We don't have a clue how they did that, and yet the same guys who did all those things that we today can't figure out how they did did all that while thinking that we we're in a snow globe. So at this point. Uh, I don't know. I, I I have to keep searching. <laughs> and, you know, maybe that's the point. Yeah. Maybe that's it's, the point. it's the most exciting thing that's ever come around in my lifetime. And I, I'm so happy to have figured it out. I uh, kind of watched Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues and uh, the uh, something funny happened on the way to the moon, uh, kind of throwing NASA aside first and uh, the Apollo missions. And since then I've been, like you were saying, obsessed. It's all I think about and all I do. It took me a while to digest it all before I started speaking out about it, quite a while in fact, but I did do lots of research and I, I watch and listen to so many videos per day. It's, it's scary. I eat, breathe, sleep, and even dream, even last night, my very first flat earth dream, this whole subject. It's it's exciting and it's inescapable and it affects almost every aspect of our life. You, uh, you hear a story about like asteroids, like we were talking about before, and you can say to yourself, well, that really can't happen. So I don't need to really worry about it unless they fake one. So it's, uh, I mean, at least that's my perspective on it. 